say we've reached a point now where we interact with like 50k bloggers and not just bloggers as well we do youtubers podcasters and just online content creators in general just because blogging is evolving beyond just um, blogs and youtube so you've got a lot of social media influencers as well like these lovely ladies <laughs> so you are speaking about bloggers youtubers podcasters and okay. social media influencers as well mm. use also instagram yes okay is uh, one so, of the so it's instagram the twitter snapchat it's always evolving so we don't even know what's going to come next because instagram launched igtv i don't know mm, if you guys are using yeah. it already and we think that's going to be like the next big thing uh, which kind of subjects your community are interest on um, a bit of everything. We encourage everyone to share what they're into. And we don't try to limit people or put people in like specific, like have Black British blogs be defined by one topic or one niche. Like we talk about a lot of different things. So one of my favorite things about starting the group was interacting and meeting lots of different types of voices. So we have nurses, we have like lots of beauty, lots of hair, fashion, lifestyle, people dealing with like mental health issues, people dealing with chronic illnesses and it's a really good outlet and I think for the community as well I think there's a lot there can be a bit of silence around certain issues I don't know if I'm like overstepping, mm -hmm. overstepping but having that space where they can share their stories and have it be validated by other people going oh I can relate to that experience works really well to bring it back to Facebook on Facebook because it's a bit more private that yes. group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, we still live uh, in a society with uh, racism? I think racism is global it's not just a UK thing an American thing or a Europe thing it's global, but it's, it comes in droves in different places. So in the UK, racism is very under the carpet, it's very quiet, it's more microaggressions in the workplace, in public transport, things like that. But places like America, it's more um, in your face, more overt, people are more confrontational because there's more um, tension mm -hmm. in that country than there are in places like the UK. But there is tension in London and places like that. It's just that it's not as big as the US. And you have to look at the history of the countries as well. The US has quite a volatile history with racism. So it's more apparent day to day. But in London, it's more so if a big issue happens, it's topic for about four days and it goes away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really get solved or talked about continuously. Whereas in America, race is a huge issue that's continuously spoken about all the time. Um, I've been to places like Italy, uh, France, and I've experienced racism there as well. So it just depends really in the time and moment. But I've been to places like Bali and haven't experienced any type of racism. So really it's about the people that are there, but also the experience, because not everybody's experience is the same. Yeah. Uh, but do you think, and now I, I ask Jai, do you think uh, Europe is prepared to receive uh, African people? Upper middle class or upper middle um, black people, then they're more readily accepted to come into the community. But um, you also have issues with immigrant um, immigrants coming over where um, they're not readily accepted and there is a lot of xenophobia in Europe. Um, there is the kind of terminology, especially in the UK, is kind of get out of my country. You have that narrative sometimes outside of London. But um, yeah, I do feel like there is still that tension. It's because I feel like a lot of people are not educated to the history of the countries um, in which we're African people are coming to and why they would want to come to these countries um, and about the resources and the aid and the, the kind of intertwined links between those two countries. So if people don't understand that, then there's, of course, there's going to be xenophobia because they're not educated to us why these people want to come to a country. So yes, I feel like it is, it, there is a kind of tension there. And no? You also um, say yes no, no. because there's, there's <laughs> loads of black people in Europe already. Yeah, yeah. Um, they create their own communities. Yeah, and we create our own communities. So yes and no, because we already exist here as well. You also create now because yeah. you yeah. are really yeah. concurrence yeah. of media. Yeah. 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 And somehow how can, you know, me and everybody that is, uh, is here listening to you can trust in your sources? When you talk about our experience, it's things that other people can corroborate, it's things that other people can validate and experience and relate to. So if you have 500 black women saying, I feel this too and I can relate to your content and, you know, this is why I'm empowered, then why would you then question that source? Um, just because it hasn't got studies or statistics at the same time, there's certain things you cannot quantify. So our experience is most definitely a valid piece of evidence when it comes to our source and our, our media that we create. Right now, when speaking about this empowerment of women, through your platform, you feel in some way more, more protected and your ideals more protected since they are shared with so many people? Yes, we are protective of our space and our circle, but we still want it to be open enough for people to feel like they can come in and be welcomed. Mm. So it's not so much a thing of we're scared of anything getting stolen because that's been happening for years. Mm. It's a thing of we just want our platforms to be what they are for us, by us, 
and the people that walk through the doors or they come onto our platforms feel like that somebody's there catering to them. Mm. They don't feel like somebody's taking their experiences and changing them and making them into something completely different to what they are. We're people that they can look at and see, okay, she looks like me or she sounds like me or whatever it is that's very similar and I can identify with her. So therefore I feel safe in this space yeah. mm. and I can relate to whatever it is that she has and it's more credible than if I went to say a magazine that has no experience of that space mm. and they've probably spoken to one person and got their mm. experience and then gone off of that as the narrative of the story, people may not be able to you know, feel safe on that because they don't know whether to trust those, those spaces or people. Mm. So for us, I think we'd create a space where it's trustful, but also relatable at the same time. Rachel starts speaking also about hair mm -hmm. and about products. And actually, you had a lovely sentence that uh, I cannot uh, you know, say it again, but something like, you have to assume yourself as you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, these kind of things also, also will uh, take us to empowerment of women, mm -hmm. but uh, the acceptance of ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, who are the people that look? For instance, L'Oreal uh, has a shampoo specific for yeah. curly hairs. Yeah. And, uh, so I've worked with brands like L'Oreal, not for hair, more for makeup. And I've worked. With I, I, I would like not to speak about. Uh, no, but no, I start. So never mind. No, that's fine. <laughs> so when it comes in relation to brands that I work with, for me, it's about partnering my image with what they're trying to create for the audience. So say, for instance, they want to specifically target black women. I have the audience, which are black women. Therefore, that relationship has to make sense. It can't be a thing of you're just going to sell product on my platform for my people. They're going to buy it and that's it. It has to be uh, either a campaign or an ad that makes sense. So I recently worked with Pantene mm -hmm. and we did content together because they, they currently come out with a new range for black hair. And they have this whole campaign about black girls do and black girls hair. So we spoke about what would make sense and how realistic it is for my platform because I ha kind of have an understanding of what my followers like and what they don't like. And there's, they, they're going to know if I'm doing something that doesn't make any sense. They're going to say, what is this? Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. But I think for my platform, I started in hair because there was nobody on the internet that looked like me with mm -hmm. hair like me from the UK. Yeah. It was a big thing in the US. There was nobody in the UK doing it. So I started doing it in 2011. Before that, I did fashion mm -hmm. blogging when it was more of a diary form. It wasn't so much an internet craze. It was just more like you just wrote entries for your diary. And over the years, it's now transpired into doing beauty, fashion, I speak at events for women empowerment. I do a lot of body positive content now because I am plus side and full figured. So I like to show women that look like me, that have a bit more curves um, on my platform so that they can feel like they're also in the narrative because a lot of times they're left out. So it's more so just creating content that works for whoever's looking at my page. Speaking about, uh, uh, about the empowerment of women and mm -hmm. having in mind that uh, uh, you are woman, yeah. so uh, do you feel difficulties and extra difficulties because you are African in markets such UK? Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. Because always... this question has uh, one, the first derivative and the second. Mm -hmm. The first yeah. one is because you are woman. woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if we go to a place with yeah. the hair like that, or that, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. things well, can change. One, being yeah. a woman, a lot of the beauty um, campaigns or brands that I work with are, ma are majority run by men, white yeah. men specifically. So explaining to them sometimes the content or the the ad that I want to create might not make sense to them because they don't understand that to be true to them. Yeah. But then also being a black woman or an African um, descent woman, you have the struggle of I now have to explain who I am again on top of being a woman, which is another factor. Mm -hmm. So when I'm now explaining myself to brands or trying to work with brands, I know there may be a possibility they don't want to work with me because I am black. Mm -hmm. And I, have to, I had to accept that years ago because I don't fit into what the narrative is or what the brand aesthetic is. So I have to be aware of that. But I've got to the point where I don't really care. I see it more so if you don't want to work with me, that's fine. I can go somewhere else or create my own content. Um, what I think is very interesting is a lot of brands are now seeing that black women are creating their own content regardless mm -hmm. of who the face is. And they're now coming to us and saying, we need you because mm -hmm. we realize we can't reach your audience. So we need you to be a part of our campaign. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it kind of goes hand in hand, but it's still a struggle when you only see one black face in a campaign or five white women, or you see mm -hmm. one black girl, one Asian girl, and then it's like 10 white women. Or for instance, Foundation Shades. Yeah. Recently, Fenty Beauty has changed the whole industry mm -hmm. with all the Fenty Shades that, that came out. Things like that, things that should have happened years ago, but are now starting to change. So because it's starting to change, we're now becoming hot property as such yeah. mm -hmm. in this industry. Uh, can yeah. I just follow on from what Rachel yeah. said? I think it's also in terms of what we're trying to do as influencers is change the norm mm -hmm. and change the default. So like she said, white women 
tend to, for us specifically, we have to explain what we are twice. But that's also because the norm and the default in the beauty industry is the white woman. So what we're trying to do is make sure that people don't just think of beauty and immediately see a white woman or see a skinny woman or see a woman with straight hair. We're trying to make sure that we can be in that place when people think of beauty. And a lot of brands still have this default go to a white woman, blonde hair, long straight hair kind of view. And that's what makes it even more difficult for us to work with brands. If I guarantee if we were white, then a lot of brands would have come to us to work with us um, and we would probably have a lot more content um, than we do at the moment because they wouldn't see us as just a, a, a token black woman for their brand. Yeah, and mm. jumping off that as well because one thing I've noticed is that we only get opportunities specific to black womanhood. We yeah. don't get the general campaigns. Yes. We don't get yeah. just the... Because mm -hmm. you have, like, if you're a content creator who's a black woman, you have to speak about being a black woman all the time. And it's like, I feel like we get limited by that. Mm. It would be nice to be included in just general mm -hmm. campaigns. Exactly. But I think us starting out as well and on, on our journey of um, being influencers is always like a battle when it comes to money, I think. Because not only in regards to what you're worth and your value, but at the same time, you get so many people that just want you to do things for free. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot well. of people will do it too. And, and then, yeah, so you'll get the people, companies, businesses that will contact you, asking you to, whether it's promoting a, their item, their product for free. And because a lot of people will do it for free, then sometimes it's a bit harder mm -hmm. to then ask will yeah. get what you're asking for mm -hmm. because then it's like well we can go to all these other people that mm -hmm. are doing it for free why would we pay you x amount but then i think that's why it's really important to know your worth mm -hmm. yeah because yeah. i think that's really really key um knowing your worth and at the end of the day we, you're knowing and you're understanding what that brand is getting by you promoting something to your audience yeah so that's always a bit of a battle as well especially in the uk yeah mm -hmm. do you think uh, european companies really have a huge market in Africa. And I'm not speaking only about beauty, I'm speaking general speaking, mm. but uh, you know, if, uh, if the value that comes from small communities, you mm. know, I, I could be blonde and perhaps I will paint my hair or something like that. If it will be proved that, that uh, uh, brown hair will spend less than blonde, so there is a market, yeah? yeah. So if you go to the Nordics, perhaps the companies have more. In this case, it's because we are speaking about the relationship between Africa and Europe and the mm -hmm. fact that Europe needs Africa as Africa needs Europe. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a huge opportunity for, for uh, I think it companies depends, of beauty? I think it depends on what the company is. And mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of education in certain cultures in Africa who don't know that their worth or value mm -hmm. is this, and a company will come in and say, we'll offer you this because we know it's more of more than what the going rate is at the moment, but you could actually get 10 times more than that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's exploitation rather than it is good. And I think if industry. companies are going to go in and actually work with Africa on a fair standpoint, it will work. It will work. Yeah. Yeah. But history says something different. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just, I don't, to just kind of go in or uh, like not knowing what you're actually asking for. I don't know. I just feel like there needs to be that sort of foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm. or just trying to create some sort of foundation. I feel like also, because then it goes well, back to trust. Like when companies go global, they seem to forget that black people are part of the global world mm. as well. So if you're going to go as a company into Africa and you want to market your product, you're going to be marketing to black people. So you should have a product that represents black people. So when you're talking about companies going in, they have to be represented, representative actually of a truly global market. But a lot of companies don't do that. They export a European image, European um, superiority essentially, mm -hmm. and go into Africa. And then that's why the balance is tipped. Well, as opposed to doing what Tree said, having that trustworthy relationship, having that kind of going in and giving back. Mm. But that's not what happens a lot of the time. So we actually have to feel like the global, the way people look at narratives, again, a lot of people have narratives, but they don't actually see narratives for what they are. If you're talking about mm -hmm. a global planet, then you have to include everyone and make sure everyone's getting things fairly. If not, you're talking about a European-centric business, and that's what it is. But I hope it's not forever, but that's the dynamic that it is currently. But I do know there are people making changes. There are people trying to approach things in a more ethical way. And I think if more people adopted that, I think there'd be a lot more trust. Because at the moment, I've only seen a European company, well, a, so a UK company, go into Nigeria, which is where I'm from, 
and I've, they're the only couple I've seen do it kind of successfully, and that was Sleek Makeup. And they actually sleek, 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 so sleek they makeup. Yeah. Sleek went into they were black owned initially. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they went into Lagos <laughs> and they literally connected with people on the ground. So they actually tapped into influencers there. They did a huge campaign and it, it felt organic. It didn't feel like something was placed them. It was like, take it or leave it. So they kind of worked with the community in a really big way. So that it, sleek now feels organic to Lagos yeah, because yeah. of the way they approached it. But I feel like sometimes, when, especially when, like, when I'm in Lagos, I'm always interested when I see all these like, companies like Nivea, mm. or, well, I don't want to quote Nivea, but yeah. like <laughs> skincare <laughs> companies um, <laughs> who sell lightning creams mm. in African countries, but oh, they yeah. wouldn't That's dare to sell it in, the UK. in Europe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Now in Portuguese, obrigada. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Thank you.